Hello everyone and welcome to day 52 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Uh, we continue with logic design and other related uh, hardware description language implementation issues today, uh, pretty much where we left off. So if you recall, um, we finished a module inliner uh, partly as a useful standalone thing as an exercise, but also um, as a uh, building block in the simulator we'll be writing today. Um, and so uh, let me just remind you what that does. <clears throat> if you have a top-level module that represents sort of an external, you know, it, it represents a circuit with, a set, with an externally defined interface of what you might think of as the pinout of a chip. Um, but then the internal module interfaces are not really pertinent. You don't have to preserve those boundaries. You can inline them away, and um, that can be useful for various reasons. In particular, it will turn out to be useful for doing simulation in order to break certain apparent uh, uh, cycles in the graph and so let me give an example of that just to refresh your memory or if you didn't see it last time so this is uh, our, our top level module in this test and what we have is we have a sub module called inf2 which is just a, a, a bank of two inverters and the inverters are basically independent so it just connects uh, i i1 to o1 and i2 to o2 through an inverter um, as you can see if we uh if we uh, look at this, you can see they're just, this is one module, but there's two independent uh, inverters in that bank. Um, and so this is uh, this is the top level thing. And you can see there's a cycle at this level. Uh, and then what we want to do is we want to essentially inline this into the top level module, getting rid of you know this box, at which point um, the, uh, you know, the, the underlying acyclic nature of the data dependencies will become apparent. Uh, and so, that's what we do with this optimization function, inline top module. Um, initially, we get uh, we get a version with everything kind of inlined and pulled straight, but we, we have these wire nodes indicated by, by empty circles, um, which are there in order to facilitate um, uh, just, the opt uh, just the transformation process. Um, but then if you want, you can do a second pass after that to remove the wires. In terms of functionality, the wires just represent levels of interaction that don't perform any logic function. Um, so if you want to, you can think of them kind of like buffers, um, but um, really are, are don't have it don't even have an electrical purpose like a buffer does. It's really just a formal device uh, for manipulating the graph more conveniently. So cyclic three is with the wires removed, and so here you have really what you kind of want, which is just everything pulled straight so here. Uh, even though things were, were cyclically threaded through that uh, sub-module, now everything is pulled straight and looks clean. So we did that last time. Um, just to follow up to that, that uh, after doing that, um, I got so annoyed at some of the redundancy in the different visitor case dispatch uh, code that um, I ended up collapsing a lot of the different types of operators to a single node. Um, in fact, everything I could collapse, I collapsed. So now there's a single operator node. And uh, it's a very attic operator, so it, uh, it you can have anywhere between zero and however many operands. Um, and in fact, uh, the intention is that even for something like the AND operator, which you might canonically think of as being a binary operator, you can, if you want to, you can represent a an an airy, uh, you know, multi fan in uh, version of that uh, with this kind of thing. Even though right now those standard operators are only constructed in binary. Uh, binary variants and so now all of these things just uh, call and construct this node and this just simplifies a bunch of the um, that's even for bit concatenation that just simplifies a bunch of the handling code even when which is a multiplexer is treated as a ternary operator node um, and this works out really well because almost everything you're handling with operator nodes is uniform regardless of the operator you're choosing. The only case where right now I make distinctions is when I'm trying to visualize stuff in the graph. I, I do want to single out the way um, uh, there's a generic path that basically does what we were previously doing with binary operators and so on. And then there's a there's some special case codes for there's some special case code for concatenation. Um, in don't we have when as well? Oh yeah, uh, there's some special case code for concatenation. And the other thing you can do, this is how when nodes are visualized, is you can define some, you can define entries in this operand labels, 
um, thing where um, rather than using the default empty boxes for for the uh, input operand labels, you can specify some names, and, and these are only used if they're specified. So this basically gives us the same visualization we had before, but now uh, there's way fewer cases in um, in this hierarchy, and so you know. We, we just have a generic, so this is the copier. Uh, there's just one generic case for operators. We don't need to distinguish them because they all have the same basic feature of recursively copying the operands, right? Making a new operator based on the same, making a new operator node with the same uh, operator type. Um, so that really cut things down. All right. Um, I hope to get to some, uh, I, I hope to get to some, um, to some more logic design stuff. I was hoping to talk about shifters today. If we get to it, maybe we'll do a double length episode. Um, but I do want to do the simulator because I felt kind of bad that uh, we can't simulate stuff yet. Of course, we could use external tools or whatever, but that's kind of be missing the point. So I do want to get a simulator working um, and, uh, and then we can use that to kind of continue the development and be able to test stuff rather than just reason, reason about stuff in our, in our brains. Uh, and so that's um, task one for today. and which is going to be an ongoing task because you can, you know, you can make that fancier and fancier. Um, and, and we might not be able to support all the different uh, types of nodes today, but we will get a basic subset working, I hope. Um, so, so the basic plan I have um, for um, the basic plan I have for the simulator is actually a simple extension of what we did for um, when we were doing the DSL sort of warm-up streams uh, from the previous series of streams. Um, I think I showed you both how to do an interpreter and a compiler uh, when the graph is acyclic. And part of the reason I did the module inliner when I did is because if you inline modules, um, then all the parent cycles disappear, and then you just have a single flat thing that you should be able to sort um, based on data dependencies and do a single pass. But that requires that graph to be acyclic. And so if you're working at module granularity, then that won't be true. Uh, and so that's one of the motivations for doing, excuse me, for doing module inlining when we did. We could have delayed it until later, but um, I um, I want to be able to deal with modules in the simulator immediately. And the easiest way is just to make this, the modules go away, basically. Uh, so they only exist at the top level where they define the external interface, but internally they're completely uh, eliminated. So um, yeah. Uh, the uh, the other thing I want to do, and, and actually as preliminary to that, one thing I realized as I thought about what sh what, what should we do today, um, right now when you look at what set node does in the copier, um, what it basically does is this is the thing you use to associate a node with a new node when you're doing any kind of copier. Uh, in functional programming terms, this is really a generic base class for doing any kind of mapping where you map an old node to a new node. Um, uh, possibly with no transformation, as in this case, where you just want to make a new physical copy, but basically have the same exact structure as before. But in the case of inlining, we do more, of course. We, we don't just uh, copy it. We also inline things where appropriate. Um, so one thing you'll note is that the new node, in this case, uh, has a name that's copied from the old node. So if the old one doesn't have a name, neither does the new one, and so on. Um, but what I want to do is I want to be able to preserve names across the uh, when you do module inlining, uh, just in order to keep things debuggable so that we can see where the things originally came from after they've been flattened in. So uh, one thing I want to do to the inliner before we start the simulator proper is I want to have a, a way to pass down a prefix path as you're doing inlining, and then every time you're generating a new name by copying something, you're going to um, you're going to prepend a prefix, and um, that way we will um, we will have these intelligible names. And unambiguous names, and so um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm I'm simply going to um, to have a prefix here, and so you can pass it down. It can be empty by default, in which case really nothing happens. Um, and then I I'm, I'm going to um, override this function here. Um, and I am actually fine with just uh, basically doing this, uh, relying on the super for, for most of the work. And then I'm just going to overwrite um, the new node name by, um, by prepending the prefix. And I should say, I only want to do this um, if there is something to prepend. So if it's not none, if it actually is specified, then I want to 
um, prepend my prefix. And so this is this is it as far as this goes. Uh, then I also um, uh, then of course we need to extend a prefix when we go down the hierarchy. So um, let's see here. You can see we go down this hierarchy here. Um, I'm going to call this prefix. So so inline module is going to get a prefix argument, and that's going to pass down to the inliner. Um, and then this prefix here is going to be um, um, I think this is what it's called um, and um, even if so if I do let, let me show you how how this thing associates with what we've seen here. In this case here, um, capital I inv2 is the module class name, but the specific instance in this context is called lowercase inv2. So basically, if if inv2 has, um, I mean, you, you, you can imagine, let, let me just do it just to actually show. S suppose we define these temp signals internally, uh, and these are labeled, uh, and this is obviously very common. Um, I want, in the context of this thing of being inlined into the parent, I want this to be called m2 underscore t1, m2 underscore t2. That's the idea. Um, so, um, however, sometimes you have module instances that don't have names. And in that case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the... Um, I don't know. Um, I mean, the, the reasonable thing to do would just be to take the, um, maybe for example, take the class name and then lower class, it, lower case it, but you have to, uh, you have to somehow disambiguate between different, um, yeah, I mean, we, we can start with that without trying to uniquify different class instances. But basically, uh, what I'm going to do is, if you have a module class, uh, if you don't have a module name specified specific directly, I'm going to take the name, and um, I'm just going to lowercase it. Um, and that's going to be the prefix. And then the prefix is going to be uh, our existing prefix plus underscore um, plus prefix. No, actually, let's say the prefix implicitly has the trailing underscore, so we could just do direct concatenation. So then what I have to do is I have to do this. Um, and so first, let's just try that and see what happens and see if we broke anything. Okay, so this should be I2. Um... Okay. So yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. Um, you can see you see the local name of this node, and then you see the uh, the instance prefix there. Um, the way in which you can. So here's the kind of thing that can happen. Um, suppose this thing is inside another structure. Um, and the only way you can reach it is because it's connected ultimately to the output. So I'm just going to wrap this in a in a in a list, and and this is this is just one level of direction. But you can imagine somehow the 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 point is even though there's a name associated with something that contains it, we, that doesn't really belong to it per se. What makes it included? Uh, what what ultimately makes that inverter uh, included in the uh, in this uh, top level module is the fact that it's reachable from one of the outputs. So it's based entirely on dependencies. Um, and so if, if we do this, uh, you know, we should get in two and that's not based on the name of this. Like if, if I call, if I call this ASDF, um, you can see, I get that. In fact, I should probably use the upper original name rather than trying to manipulate it, um, just in case. That, that way it's utterly clear where it came from. Um, 
and, and and later I will do something where you know everything will get a like an extra one two three if there's a name collision or something like that in in the scope. Um, so you can see now we get the the unadulterated module class name as a prefix. Um, all right. Have a good night. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the motivation why you want to have a fallback for that uh, to to generate a name, just so you have something to tag onto it. All right, so um, that was step one. That was easy. Um, okay, let's do the simulator now, or let's start working on the simulator. And so. Uh, I'm actually going to make it a compiler rather than doing a graph evaluator. So if you remember originally when we did the experiments, we had basically, and this was, I mean, it was mostly the whole point of, the, of this sort of was like to do a very toy version of what we would do later. And so I showed some of the basic, same basic ideas, but in a simpler setting. So the evaluator we did was basically a graph evaluator. Um, and we could do the same thing here, but, um, since there's way more cases for us to handle now than before, I don't want to I don't want to have to manage to both duplicate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do the compiler, um, and um, th then there's only one thing to handle. Of course, we'll also have backends that generate, say, Verilog code or whatever, which is for sort of more serious compiled simulation. But for the stuff we want to be able to sort of run at the snap of our fingers inside uh, Python, we're just going to have a compiler rather than a, a direct graph evaluator. So that's the idea. If you remember the way we did. Um, the way we did uh, compilation is that we have a linearizer, um, and we could merge this with the compiler proper, but basically the idea is we have a linearizer which uh, generates a linear ordered, uh, a linear ordered um, list based on the graph such that all output dependencies are computed before they're needed. Or sorry, yeah, all, all dependencies are computed before they're needed, and so that way when you're evaluating an expression, you can just assume that the inputs are ready um, and it detects that as part of the process. If, if it finds a cycle that prevents that linearization from being possible, it will complain loudly. And that's also the reason we do module, uh, you know, module inlining is set so that um, we get rid of any spurious cycles. Um, and so, yeah, um, the, you really just, so, so, so the way I, uh, the, the way I did this one here, and we maybe end up just merging it, um, Although I think having a standalone linearizer might be useful, but basically this ends up being kind of like a single assignment form intermediate language where there are these pseudo instructions, which are just correspond very directly to the different operators. Um, and then you just, you know, have a list of instructions as you go. Um, and so this is sort of the abstract intermediate language. And then uh, there's a compiler which maps those onto Python code and, uh, actually generates, you know, at runtime compiles a, a Python function, uh, in our case would probably be a Python class, based on on that generated code and returns it. Um, and so that's the idea. And I think I'm going to have the, uh, well, I think I'm going to have the intermediate language um, just because it's it's useful to be able to look at it on its own and it may be useful for other things as well. Like if we want to generate C code, for example, it would be nice to have a flat intermediate representation rather than having to always do graph traversal to do that. Because once you're generating that kind of code, it's nice to just be able to walk things linearly. Um, and so you only have to handle everything once. Um, so um, so let's just do that. And so um, I guess, did, did we use a copier? No, no. So for, for this, we don't use the copier because we're not, um, in this case, we're not really returning things. Maybe we're returning names of nodes. Yeah, so what we're going to do is, if you look at the original visitor for the copier, um, this is, you know, I, I said it was like a mapper in the functional programming sense. It takes a node as input and produces a related node as output. In the copier's case, a copy of that node. In the inliner's case, a copy of that node, possibly with any recursive inlining done along the way. Um, when we do the linearizer, we're going to map most of the action is going to be in the side effects rather than what's returned. And so we're going to map from a node to the name of a variable that contains the computed result of evaluating that node. And so that way, if we want to compute something, we can just reference that variable name. Things have already been filled in for us by the time we execute. So that's the idea. Um, 
and so um, let's see. So I guess we, we just need a counter. Uh, I don't think we need this. We can just get these directly. Um, yeah. Uh, um, so let, let's just start. So we have a list of instructions. Um, and actually, let me open a split like we did last time. Let me make a split screen window with a list of all the different um, all the different cases, just so I know when I'm done. Uh, so input node, wire node, output node, operator node. Index node, slice node, constant node. Instance input node, instance output node, um, module. This is specifically sub module, something you run into when you're handling that. So, um, um, what I'm going to say is that these can't be encountered because these involve submodules. So if we've already removed all modules prior to linearizing, then we can't encounter this. And we also can't encounter this um, because this is encountered when you basically the way you reach a module is you reach one of its instance node, uh, instance input or output nodes, and then you recurse into it. So we can't reach that either. Um, these we can reach. Um, normally you wouldn't be able to. No, yeah, you start at output nodes. So you, you start at output nodes, and then you, you, you go down from there. Wire nodes, we, I mean, I could say that they have to be eliminated prior, but it's very easy to eliminate them as we're seeing them. We can just basically cut them out on the way and, and short circuit it. Um, so there's no reason to do that as a separate pass. And so you can see that's actually a, a fairly limited number of cases. Of course, the operators encompasses a bunch of specific cases, but uh, from the linearizer's point of view, it's just an abstract instruction. It doesn't. The linearizer itself doesn't have to worry about the semantics of what that operator means. So that's another reason it's convenient to split it out like this. Um, all right. So if you encounter an input node, um, then um, <clears throat> let's see. So. Um, Let's first assert that it has a name uh, because this is top level, unlike the sub, you know, so we definitely need to make sure this has a name. And um, um, I'm just going to make a function here. Um, We're just going to have a tuple for this stuff. <clears throat> and so um, I'm just going to say this is an input node. This just means read from the named input. Um, and um, uh, we need a way to generate temp names. Um, so yeah, you can see we have one here. I guess we'll, we'll do the same sort of thing. So, uh, and you, you could do better names over time, right? Like if, if there's something you could use to sort of make it more uh, indicative of what it's being used for. But that's the idea, yeah. So you have, just in order to create some unique names, you have this, you, and you use these short names just so things don't get cluttered by super long identifiers. But yeah, you generate, um, you take this prefix and prepend it. And if you want, you can use some something to make it more unique. Um, but the easiest way in the first pass is, first off, ignore the, the node names themselves, because if you use those to name local variables, then you really need to make sure they're unique. And not that, you know, you can deal with that, um, but let's not do that in pass one. Let's just worry about getting the computation right. So then what we need to worry about is, uh, you know, we need to get the nodes, the names right on the inputs, because that's where you, co you hook up to the external world. But then internally, you can just... Um, um, 
uh, do whatever, right? So uh, I'm going to say this is the destination, um, and these are the operands. And so the format is first first element of the tuple is the destination operand. So this is a, a name. Um, this is the thing you're you're computing the value of, and here's the operator. And this is prefix notation. So for example, if you had um, uh, you know if if you had recursively you you want to do the equivalent of this where t1 and t2 represent the variable names, uh, then you generate a new thing, and um, you basically generate this tuple here. Um, like that. So that's that's going to be the abstract instruction corresponding to that. Um, Let's call this make temp. God damn it. One, one split too many. Um, um, for wire nodes, what I'm actually just going to do is first I'm going to assert that it actually has an operand, meaning the wire is connected to something that's driving its value. Uh, and then I'm just going to uh, recursively visit that operand. So that's what that short circuits the wire. That means that nothing related to the wire is there's not going to be a temp variable that doesn't do anything. It's going to directly give you whatever that thing is connected to. And that works through multiple level, levels of wire nodes if necessary. Uh, output node. Um, Let's see, output node. All right, let's assert that node name is also not none. Um, Um, I guess same deal. The difference being um, there has to be an operand. There has to be something driving the output. Um, and so you do this, and you have to recursively visit it. Because then when you recursively visit it, you get the name of this thing. Actually, let's... Uh, Let's just do it like this. Um, so node name and where it comes from. Um, operator node, uh, this thing is easy to handle because we simply um, here we just uh, we use the, the node op as the instruction the op code for the instruction and then we have to recursively um, we have to recursively evaluate the operands um, Um, so that's operator index. I mean, uh, almost all of these are sort of in the same general bucket. So index, um, you have, I believe, an operand, and then you have an index, and the operand you have to recursively visit. Um, slicing is basically the same. In fact, these two can kind of be collapsed, maybe. Uh, maybe not quite. 
depending on how you want to treat. If you want to treat a bit as the same thing as a length one bit vector, you could collapse them, but otherwise, I guess not. But anyway, um, so there are two indices here for this one. Uh, constant node, this is. Um, Oh, one thing I should mention that's actually pretty important is the types. There should be a type. Um, let's do it like this, just to make sure those things are always provided. Um, and the type just comes directly from the node. So um, but the reason is the operators are polymorphic, right? They can be used with different types. And we, we want to directly communicate what the inferred types are. That's not something you want to leave to, to the back end to re, uh, recapitulate. So, and I thought about it in the context of a constant because uh, all you're really doing with a constant is you're just providing the value. And so a value like zero can have totally different meaning uh, on a circuit level, depending on, uh, you know, like you need to know the type to know whether it's like, is it a single bit zero? Is it a 32 bit vector that corresponds to zero, whatever, uh, something like that. So that's constant node. Um, and then I'm going to um, Module cannot even be encountered directly, um, so we don't have to worry about that. So I think that's it as far as those things go. Um, let's move that up. Uh, the sister, your sister when she's visiting. All right, um, so let's see if that works. Um, so what we're going to do is, um, for, first let's actually verify, let's just start with some simple examples and then see that it detects the cycles and complains about it and then let's see what happens when we inline it out. So uh, let's just start with the inf2 directly. Um, so suppose we take, um, oh, and we have to write a front end. Uh, as always. So uh, you want to linearize a module and um, uh, you make a linearizer and um, you uh, Have to go through the the inputs and outputs. Visit those. Um, so get those. So um, I think you want what you want for that is you want. Um, you actually don't care about the temp name directly, uh, but you do care about the type. In theory, you can get that from the module, the original module, but uh, 
I kind of want the thing that the linearizer returns. I want that to be a self-contained thing. I don't want you to have to use it in combination with the module. So I'm going to put in basically uh, all the node types so that um, you know the names and you know the node types of those associated with those names for the ports. Um, um, and for the outputs, you actually do care about um, what you might call it. You do care about um, where the result is. And so for those, um, I'm going to have a tuple which consists of both the node type and the result, maybe in reverse order. Um, and then when we're done, I want to return uh, the inputs, the outputs, and the instructions. Um, and so now, uh, if I linearize in 2, let's see what happens. We have to um, we have to call the super. Okay, so there's a case we didn't handle. Let's see what that is. Um, did we really not handle input nodes? Seems unlikely. So let's see here. Node. Wrong order. Yeah. Okay, so that at least ran to completion without errors. Um, so let's let's see what these actually say. By the way, moving random anecdote. Um, I used to program a lot in Python 2 back in the day, and then I took a hiatus. But the, the hardest thing about going to Python 3 for me is just my muscle memory, assuming that print is an operator rather than a function. I think I'm finally starting to shake it. But all right, so the input i1 is a bit, i2 is a bit, o1 is a bit, and its result can be found in t2. Um, O2 is a bit, and its result can be found in, in T5. Um, um, just do something nicely human readable and then maybe we can use that in a different context.
Oh. <laughs> That's my wife. Uh, too many values to unpack expected to. It's because I'm doing... It's all this bundle crap. This is from some earlier experiments. Okay. Temp type uh, is it op temp type op operands and so then I want to do temp type um, then I want to use a Lisp notation. Um, all right, so that looks right. I think the all caps is maybe a little bit too 1960s. Uh, don't see the. Okay. So let's see. Uh, so invert this, invert T4. The fact that there's two levels of this, which basically don't do anything. I mean, this is a double inverter. This, that actually looks wrong. T0 is the original input. We're not doing this to cyclic. We're doing it to inv2. Oh, no, that is right, actually. So, so it... It's correctly picking up on a bug I had left in. All right. Um, so yeah, that looks right. <clears throat> And then really our task is just to compile that. Um, most of it is pretty straightforward. I think the only things that are going to take anything other than direct translation is that you have to be careful about masking for bit vectors and you have to make sure you implement slicing correctly. So um, I, I, so, so let me just say something. The first, the, the, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to exploit the fact that Python has arbitrary precision integers. We won't really be using things that are longer than fixed width, um, like 32 or 64 bit, I would say almost all the time, but we have the option to go above it and that's convenient. Uh, and Python's bit shifting operators and all the other bitwise operators work on arbitrary precision integers. So we can just make use of them um, with, without worry. Um, if we do a C simulator ourselves, that one of the things you have to do is handle uh, arbitrary width bit vectors typically. Um, which for most things is not super 
I mean, most things are just entry wise, but things like shifts and addition and a few other things, I mean, it becomes like a little arbitrary precision library. So it's nice we can just uh, piggyback on Python for that. But um, let me just uh, write out how you do these things for bit vectors. <laughs> okay, so first off, um, the basic plan of attack for um, if you have a single bit, it's represented by an integer that's 0 or 1, right? So it's a an integer, but it only has the least bit set. If you have a bit vector of, of width n, then only the, the least n bits can be set. Not all of them have to be set, of course, but only that many can be set. Um, most bitwise operators don't increase. Um, right now, also, all the operators, uh, most of those op bitwise operators don't have automatic broadcasting or zero extension or anything like that. You need exactly the right width. Uh, you need to pad it out yourself, uh, which makes the translation job easier for us. We don't have to worry about different, too many possibilities. Um, so the point is, for certain things, like if you just want to do this, um, it's, it's already presumed that x and y have the same bit width. And so when you end them, they already have the right, like there's no, they don't get wider, right? So you don't have to worry about masking. Um, if you add them, you have to mask in order to get the right semantics. So you, you, you basically have to, uh, for a given bit width, you have to create some temp variables that are like, you know, if, if there's a mask 32, you want to define a bunch of local variables up front in your compiled function that look like this. So um, then you can, you know, you, you can do mask 32, assuming um, this is supposed to be a 32-bit bit vector. Um, but most things don't need to be masked. It's only things like shifts and you know multiplication and, and whatnot, uh, slicing. No, not even slicing. The way we implement slicing, it won't be necessary. Uh, it will sort of it will mask as part of that. But uh, just a note. So that's how you have to do masking for things that can kind of propagate bits upward um, in order to get the right result. Of course, that means we're throwing away precision, but we, we're trying to simulate the semantics that correspond to an actual bit vector. Um, so that's the idea for that. For for um, for indexing, if you do this to a bit vector, that translates to uh, right shifting by i and masking by one. Um, if you do this, it's basically just an extension. You have to um, you basically align the the slice. So if you're slicing from four to eight, you shift down by four, and then you have to end by a mask, which is let's see. Um, J. Uh, is that right? Um, so if it's three, four, you shift down by three, um, and then you want to isolate the four lowest bits. Um, well, I, I, let's say uh, seven. Which, I mean, I guess you can just say this is mask, whatever. Mask four. Or, uh, yeah, mask four. So maybe that's the way to do it. What I'm going to do is, as I'm, as I'm compiling stuff, I'm going to make a list of all the different masks I need, and I'm just going to refer to them by name, like mask underscore four, mask underscore 32. And then once we're done, I'm just going to prepend a little prologue that generates all the different masks so that all the code can just use them, knowing they're already there. Um, and that's basically it for, for these things. Um, constants have already been pre-masked, but you can do it again, I suppose. Um, and that's pretty much it. Everything else, I mean, um, what else is there? Oh, bit concatenation, that's another one. If you want to concatenate, um, this is the binary version, but there's a general NRA version. If you want to concatenate two bit vectors um, like this, this is um, so. So keep in mind this notation is the least significant thing on the left, more significant thing on the right. So really, all you have to do here is you have to um, you have to OR in uh, x. So x x stays like basically each operand gets a position which is the prefix of all the lengths up to that point. That's the offset, right? Um, and so x has offset 0 since it's the very first thing. y has offset length of x. Um, 
So if, if X is a 8-bit vector, then Y gets shifted um, by 8 and ORed in. And if there's more, then it's the same idea. So, so you can imagine the idea is just that you have a running offset and um, um, you do something like this and um, you know, you do something like this, um, which is, by the way, this is a scan. This is a prefix sum, turns up prefix sums, turn up everywhere. This is one example. But then basically when you do this, then you can, you can do something like, uh, Um, no. Anyway, you, you, you see the point. Um, so that covers uh, indexing, slicing, concatenation, um, all the different bitwise operators and anything else that has to be masked. There's also when. Um, I think that's the other one. When is uh, basically a ternary operator. So when you do when like this, that just turns. We're just going to map that to a, a, a Python expression which is b if a l c so we're just going to we're just going to do this um, easy peasy <clears throat> um and i think that's about it as far as different operators. If, if we miss any, we'll just implement them as we run into the missing cases. But um, it's not fundamentally that hard. You just have to think through the cases. Uh, Python makes it easy for us because we already have arbitrary precision and just we can, we can uh, piggyback on. So, um, okay. Um, compile. Inputs, outputs, instructions. So we assume we get basically, we get what we got out here. Um, and so what's the task fundamentally? Um, first, we're going to, like I said, we're going to build up a set of masks we need to build along the way. Um, and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to say, um, like, I'm just going to have a function called get mask, which is going to return a string that I can splice into my Python code. So this will be my mask underscore whatever. Uh, and so um, if n not in, let's just call it n. If, if, if n is not in masks, uh, then I add it first time. Um, and then I simply um, mask underscore uh, n. So it's called mask actually. Um, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up a line buffer. I'm not going to directly construct a string. I'm going to join the lines together at the end. Um, and so uh, every instruction will generate, and, and we could use a visitor to, to simplify some of the dispatch code, but let's just uh, do it old fashioned. Um, so we know an instruction always starts with um, a destination, uh, a type, uh, an operator and operands. So we unpack that um, because we then th this these three things here are always there, so we can do some kind of analysis based on them. Um, and so um, what 
what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to have a couple of different categories that can be mapped over. So I don't want to have to do a case for every single, you know, I don't want to have to write separate code for every single unary operator. Okay, unary operator is a bad example because there's not that many of them, but you see my point. Um, uh, and we can even handle all the binary ops the same. So let's just unconditionally mask all binary ops, and then we can filter down to only doing it for things that can potentially need it. Um, so uh, unary ops, binary ops. Um, if we get when, that's a special case. If we get uh, index, that's a special case. So, so some of these we just handle, right? We just handle them one by one. Um, concatenation, that's a special case. Let's put that up here. Um, with this input, with this output. Um, inputs, we have no wires, output, operator, index, slice node, if it's a constant. Um, and then this should never happen, or we miss something. Uh, so unary ops are... I mean, and it's fine, by the way, if we forget to include something here, it will assert loudly and tell us that we forgot. So, um, actually, let me make two categories. Uh, let me say unmasked binary ops. Actually, I'll call them bitwise because that's what they are. They, they are truly bit parallel. There's no entanglement between different bits horizontally. Um, and so we can use those, and then we can say, uh, let's call them masked binary ops. Um, those are like plus, minus, which we don't have right now, but let's just put it in there. Um, plus, minus, it also includes shifting, um, that has to be masked. Actually, only, well, let's say we shift both of them. Technically, you don't need to, like, right shift, you don't need to mask, but, um, and then you, you can make, uh, you can make a list of both of these as well, if that's useful. Uh, because then you can have one case for this. Um, Actually, here's how I'll do it. I'll just put it here rather than having a separate thing. So then it's just everything else, basically. Um, so, um, for a unary op, you simply want to do um, yeah everything is flattened so we don't really have to worry about parenthesization uh, and so here you simply do dust and I'm just going to say you know there's only one source operand um, these here there are multiple uh, So destination, um, destination, 
source one, op source two, and then we need to have a mask. And the mask is based on the type width. Um, but let's call this just the width. So what I'm going to say is uh, one if type is a single bit, else it's going to be type.width. Actually, that's just the length now that I think about it. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, we already defined that correctly. <clears throat> No, I guess we can't do that because that's defined on the nodes, not on the types. That's fine. We can just do it this way. Explicit. That's fine. Um, okay. Um. Actually, let's define it on the node types as well. It seems very convenient. Or maybe not. Maybe it shouldn't be the length, actually. That's probably abusing what that operator means, because you can't really index it. Um, I take that back. Um, just unconditionally do this. It's definitely better. All right. Um, so at every step here, I guess one thing that's a little bit annoying is at this point, we don't necessarily um, know the full type matrix. So I can build that up. The question is, it might be good to have that as part of the output as well. Um, but I guess it's kind of implicit in the list. But uh, Anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to associate the destination with the type when we see it. So these are all going to be filled in by the time we get there. Um, and so for each operand, you can just ask for its type and then the width. Um, and Um, let's call these the terms. So the term for this thing is going to be, uh, I guess there's two cases. There's either just operand by itself, uh, if offset is zero. Uh, otherwise, we, um, otherwise we surround it in a shift. Um, but in either case, once we've done that, we append a line where we, um, I'm really, yeah, uh, where we join together all of the terms like this. Um, for when, um, it should be straightforward. Um, destination source two. Um, let's say this is cont, then uh, uh, 
parentheses. So destination, then temp. Um, this is called var. This is what they are. Then var, cont var, else var. var. For, uh, for indexing, uh, we simply end by one. Um, so that's dust and no, actually, so, so wait, so it's it's index and source. So I have to, sorry, I have to shift over by that amount and then mask. So I shift over the source operand. I think this is the operand order. I shift over the source, source operand by the index amount and then mask. Uh, for slicing, it's similar. Um, you have to shift over by Um, let's see, you have to shift over by um, let's see, so dust source start and then mask stop minus start um, for source input let's see what do you get you get the destination and you get the input name and this is just basically going to turn into a straight assignment because it's assumed it's an art well maybe it's actually going to be self dot something so let, let's say that actually this is going to be some kind of evaluation method that lives on a class um, and so the inputs are read from member fields and similarly the outputs are written to member fields um, and so there's going to be dust and name and so this here well there's the destination which is a little bit spurious i think the destination is actually not used here no it can't be actually but um there's two operands there's the, let's see if I remember what it is for outputs. It's the name and where it comes from. So it's the name and the source. And so you say, well, I guess we can do this. Um, so destination, name, source. Uh, for consts, um, dust value, no. I'll be consistent about whether I reference it directly or not. So for const, there's just one thing, and it's just a straight up assignment. Um, a straight up assignment from dust, from value, and this has already been masked, but even if it hadn't been. Uh, all right, so I think that's it. Um, and then, Uh, you have to generate the actual code. So first off, let me just uh, let me just print those lines um, so we can get an idea of whether it's in the ballpark. I 
properties, this operator, the union. Okay. Um, hey, I'm super green, I can't see it. Okay, anyway. Hey there. All right, um, let's try compiling. I guess we can do it that way, even though it's a little bit unconventional. Oh god. Did I do a global search and replace that killed some other stuff there? Okay, it wasn't too bad. Alright, so no self. Just a closure. Okay. Um that looks correct. That looks correct. Let's try some bit shifting stuff, which I guess is where things get more interesting. Um, uh, compiler test. So suppose you have i1, you have i2, which is like four bits, and then so you concatenate them. So T0 is the least significant part, then shift it over by 8, that's correct. Uh, and if we, fit, if we flip which of these is the small and the large, then the other one's going to get uh, shifted by 4. <coughs> um, let's say that's T1, or actually, I guess that's, no, we can use that name. Um, that's T1, and then T2 is... Um, I don't know, the third bit, something like that. That doesn't look right at all. Oh, 
we have to there's no output. Um, so then we shift over by three and and, and that also looks right. Um, let's do some slicing. Say we slice from three to six. Oh, right. It doesn't know that this is a set. We just use that's one of the <laughs> the, the quirks. Um, if you do this, it knows it's a dictionary. If you if you do this, it knows it's a set. But if you do this, it, it just is you know by, for legacy reasons. But I mean, most of the time you want dictionaries, so it's the default. But um, it's something that I always forget. Um, all right. So what does it say here? You slice out a you shift over by three and then you mask by mask three. Um, okay. So the thing we have to do is um, for mask and masks. Uh, let's see, preamble. Uh, let's call it pre lines. Pre lines, what we're going to do is we are going to. Um, mask underscore that is going to be equal to a constant. Actually, we, 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 let's write it so it's computed, so it's kind of obvious from the code what it's actually doing. Um, this is going to be mask, and this is going to be mask. And then lines is going to be the concatenation. So then mask three is going to be this. So this all looks consistent. Um, what was the other stuff? So indexing, slicing, let's do multi-concatenation. Um, trying to remember how the easiest way to get that. Um, Maybe something like this. Oh, actually, I don't want this to be an output either. A little bit more than an hour. So yeah, this looks correct to me. Lowest thing is unshifted. Next one is shifted by 4. Next one is shifted by 4 plus 8, which is 12. Oh, you're right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I could. You mean like just a constant? I kind of want to do this just so when I'm reading the code, um, so that when I'm reading the code, it's a little bit more clear where the thing comes from. If I'm inlining the bit mask, and I can't totally do that, I have. To, it may not be obvious at a glance what, what amount it's, it's shifting by, so I kind of like having the number three in there um, so I can so I can kind of see the type it's trying to mask to right I can see that this t4 is supposed to be a three bit a three bit vector basically but uh, we, we can change that later if it for whatever reason we want to just have the literal there I mean we could certainly we could put the literal here but that doesn't really do anything since it's only computed once um, so let's this is more self-certifying, I guess, when you just uh, debug it as a human, I think, but uh, not a big deal. All right, so um, I think that's basically it. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of op actually. Let, let's we, we're not testing different operators, so let's let's try. Um, um, let's try XORing. Um, Let's see. So this here is three bits. Um, if you take uh, if you take t two, and um, 
you add it to well let, let's first do some some some, uh, some I mean some weird stuff some, some stuff that's not really useful logically but uh, exercises some different things Um, okay, that looks reasonable. So this is unmasked, but if I did this instead, T3 plus, not T3. Then this has a post mask. Uh, and that would also be true if I... Technically, I wouldn't need to do it on shifts in that direction, but let's say I shift it... Uh, in that direction. So both of those are that. Um, if as a precursor to the shifting, so say I just shifted by one, if as a precursor to the shifting I appended a zero, then we would actually do a multiplication by two that doesn't lose that upper part. Um, So we're shifting by one, and T5 is um, where's T12, right? So it, it doesn't, I mean, there's some constant folding opportunities that we're not taking advantage of. I don't want to do those in the compiler. I want to do those at the graph level, so I'm not going to do those here. I want the compiler to be a straightforward translation and to do everything else on the, on the graph itself. So even though this is obviously stupid in this case, um, Let's just leave it like that. Um, but then you can see we get a wider mask, so the the most significant bit of T4 doesn't get lost in the shift. All right, is that it as far as the different cases? And we need to do when as well. Um, when you know, we can take some random bit like I13, then T5, else, uh, and then we can. This is also a bit shift, by the way, uh, just done in another weird way, where rather than using a shift operator, we're just, you know, uh, prepending a zero. This is a one-bit zero. Um, but anyway, let's just make sure that compiles correctly, at least. So T6, if T5, and T5 is, is bit three. I think that's so how many cases so concatenation both mask and unmask bit wise or binary ops unary ops concatenation multiplexing with when index slice input output yep const so i think that's it in terms of just exercising it at a basic level so uh what i want to do now or what i i don't know if this is going to be the the right representation going forward but my idea is when you compile a module um it's going to basically give you um it's going to give you a class and you so let me, let me just sort of pretend this is actually like you know which is not a pretend that's actually what we're going to do um Okay, this is not even all of it, because this thing is so freaking stupid. About the window copy, but anyway, let's. So I want to basically end up with something roughly like this. Um, um, so there's a set of inputs and outputs, right? And I just basically want to set all of those to none. Some value that's going to explode loudly if you forget to set them. Um, and similarly with the outputs. 
And so I guess in this case, yeah, there's only one output. But anyway, it gets said like that. And then there's an evaluate function. And really all it does is it doesn't take inputs, but it will recompute the outputs in terms of the most recent inputs. Um, and you might wonder why I'm using this uh, approach. And basically the reason is once we move to doing things that are not purely combinational, that are not just simple things, then you want to have internal state and having this kind of encapsulated approach is better. So we're kind of treating uh, these as signals that can persist their values. Um, and it, it just becomes more convenient later when we're dealing with state to split things up that way. But of course you can build a functional interface around this where, you know, um, where basically you take these, you um, um, you do this, Actually, I want to use my bundle for that. That's part of what bundle is designed for. Um, bundle is basically a named tuple, but it has some extra smarts. But so I want to do a named bundle um, is it in here, or did I put my bundle thing over in extras? Uh, keys and values. So yeah, the bundle would basically be um, O1 equals, I guess in this case it's only O equals, so it's super simple, but um, my object dot O after doing the evaluation. So this is this is basically what you do, and you can have um, you could you, you can also have a class method or like a, you know a static method, which essentially does that. So you can directly do, and maybe that's what it should be called. Um, Uh, I don't know what you would call it. It's maybe this is evaluate, and this 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 thing is called update, and then evaluate is this version here. Um, so then you have sort of multiple choices in terms of how you want to uh, engage with it. Like you can do this updating thing, which is more appropriate when you're simulating thing across multiple cycles where the inputs are changing over time and you're computing the outputs and maybe there's some internal state that gets updated as a result of, of, of a clock ticking and stuff like that. Um, but, but, but I think this is the kind of template we want for this stuff. Uh, the idea behind a bundle is that it behaves like a tuple. So there's a bunch of named tuple type things in Python. There's an old one called named tuple, a newer one called data class, but this one here is designed for purely functional usage and it has some syntactic shortcuts that are going to be useful because the idea is bundles can be used with anything including other circuit things so you can bundle together bit vectors and kind of treat them as vectors in the APL sense where our different operators will map homomorphically over them and distribute over the components and stuff like that but one of the nice things just like most named tuples is that you can use them either as tuples or as objects so if I get back one of these uh, uh, results. So suppose I do my class evaluate, uh, you know, one, two, three. Um, actually, this just reminded me of something I have to do. There's a bug um, in the compiler. When you're reading from an input, you have to mask it. Um, because the outside world can do whatever it wants, basically. Right? Like it can pass in something and we don't want to um, we don't want to force them to, to be very careful about the, what they pass in. But we also, yeah, so, so we have to mask when we read the inputs because we don't control what inputs are passed in. <laughs> but anyway, if you do something like this, um, I mean, in this case, there's only one output, but in general, there will be multiple. So say say there's two, and it's like this. 
then first off, you can either just do this. You can just unpack it like you would with a tuple, which is often convenient when there's only a few arguments. But you can also do, uh, and by the way, you can you can do both at once because of Python sort of chain assignments. Um, and but you can also do this. You can do O1. You 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 can just access it like uh, like a, a class field. Um, and I think for what for what we need just for for, for interacting with the simulator. Um, this is probably all we need. There's reasons it's fancier than Python's named tuple. Like one of the examples is it's designed named tuple. Python's named tuple built in named tuple is also designed for purely functional use, but this one has a much easier way of updating things in place. So for example, if I do a tuple uh, like this um, or uh, like this, um, you can, uh, you can do, you, you can, you can, write this and then you can use it as a function uh, and use keyword arguments to update um, so suppose i want to do this like i want to create a new version this is a copy right it's purely functional that is, is one year older um, you can use this sort of function call notation and I, it's way more visually compact and i think also easier to read in most cases than having some kind of dot replace or whatever um, and the other advantage is if you have to have a dot replace or something like that, then replace can potentially collide with a name of the bundle um, or a, like a, a field of the bundle. So uh, anyway, that's the main difference from Python's name tuple. I think there's a few other things, but um, so we're going to use that. So basically what we want the simulator to do is we want it to, we want to generate the scaffolding around it. Um, which shouldn't be very hard. So um, um, let's see. Going to have a big template. Um, and I'm going to just go for compile template, and it's going to. I'm trying to remember, what is it? There's so many different templating libraries built into Python nowadays. Uh, I'm not going to use normal formatting because I want to have main parameters. So that's in the string module. Um, so it's going to be um, name and um,
I think something like this. So reasonable. So self update static method for evaluating. Um, Okay. How are we doing on time? An hour and a half. I'm going to finish this, but I think we're very close. This is just some scaffolding to finish it off. Um, and then when you do the substitution, you provide a mapping. That makes sense. Um, so, um, So we indent all of these lines and then update is what happens when we join them. Um, uh, let's see, let, let, let me, before we get any further, let's see if this looks reasonable. does. Um, so what do we need for the template? We need a knit, and a knit just um, So join lines with some amount of indentation, with four per level. Um, and so this thing here becomes join pre lines plus lines with two levels of indentation. So that's the same. We have both the mask and that. Um, now for the init, um, I'm going to um, we'll just reuse this lines variable. Um, for the for the init, or actually I don't even need that. Um, for init, I'm going to um, self dot whatever equals none or um, let's call them port ports um, so this is going to be a set a set of uh, of the inputs and a set of the outputs when we use it in this it's not going to take the pairs of key values uh, it's going to just take the names I'm just going to call this ports um, and so this is going to be like that. And this is going to be with one level of indentation. Um,
it looks like it's not really ordered. Um, I'd like it to be more canonical. Um, so I think if you look at the template, so these two parts are good. Now we have to do, actually, let's not even do this, right? No, actually, let's just, yeah, we can do that. Uh, so set evaluate arcs. Um, let's say evaluate inputs. This is evaluate outputs. Um, okay. So evaluate args is going to be um, a comma join of of all of the inputs. Uh, the evaluate inputs is going to be um, with one level of indentation. It's going to be what? Um, self dot whatever. Uh, self dot equals. Something like that. The evaluate outputs is going to be um, sort of the complement, I suppose. All with one level of indentation. So, finally, let's try to let's, let's do them in the same order they're referenced. Init, update, um, In it, update, evaluate args, evaluate inputs, evaluate outputs. Right, there's no name, so we have to fill that in as well. Um, I guess we can partially infer that from other stuff. Let's just spell something stupid right now. Okay, so one apparent issue is indentation, and that makes sense just because of the way I formatted the code. Uh, I think there's going to be a consistent issue. Yeah, that's fine. The way you do that is you just put it on the same line. It looks a little bit uglier in the template when you do that, but um, not a big deal. Actually, the evaluate outputs don't have to be joined in that way. They're comma joined. Oh, 
that's not bad either. Just a new line. Okay, that's right. Now I just have the wrong indentation. Should be two levels. <sighs> okay, the image code still has that issue. Every, actually, everything is indented to the same level, so there's really no point in me doing this garbage. Okay. Except this O is definitely not right. I think it's because the I want this to be the class name. Let's call that the class name, just so all the variables are consistently named across templates and whatnot. Um, all right, cool. Now. Moment of truth, um, we can go and look at our original code. It's not much we have to do. It's like exec, so code locals, whatever, um, code, code locals, then you execute it in a locals dictionary, and then you pull out the class name since that's the thing you defined. And that's it. <laughs> Um, now we have a class instead of another thing. Um, moment of truth. It's also a question. I think the debugger is not going to be happy about this. Yeah, because it can't. But anyway, uh, def evaluate. It's a static method. Okay. Yeah. If there's a static method, there's no self. Um, so what we're going to do instead, just we can call it self. Doesn't really matter. Uh, name foo is not defined. Uh, I guess we can make it a class method, in which case it's passive as the first argument. Then we don't have to worry about the environment it's evaluated in. Bundle is not defined. Oh yeah, I guess that's sort of a perennial issue with a lot of this stuff. Um, Let's use the globals of the context we compile in. It seems a little bit dicey. Oh, we already do that. The current scopes global variables. I mean, we already have bundles here, right? They're already defined in the scope. It's 
move them over here. They're kind of okay. That actually worked. So we got the value 14. Yay! I don't know if that's correct. Let's do something that I can verify another way. Um, So we double this 4-bit thing into both the upper and lower half, and we add that. Um, so I guess this thing is going to complain. So what was it, 8-bit? And so we can take 1, 2, 3, um, or let's see, we can take 200, which is a full 8-bit quantity, and then we can take 1, 2, 3, which fits in 7 bits. And let's compute it ourselves. 200 plus 1, 2, 3, uh, and it with 1, 2, 3, shift 8. So that gives a bigger number, but then we have to reduce that modulo 256. Well, that's not right. Just remind myself what I actually did here. I1, which is the first argument, is added to. Let me let me let me also print out the code, just so we're never in doubt. Um, the precedence of AND, uh, it acts like a, a multiplicative operator. It, it was originally introduced to help with matrix multiplication. So you, in uh, numerical computing, you could distinguish uh, entry-wise versus multi-matrix multiplication of arrays. So th this, th that shouldn't be the issue. Um, I mean, we, we, we can see it here. So let's see. T zero. Oh no, I'm totally high. Um, one two three is not. Uh, it should be something like thirteen. I'm totally off. I'm sorry. It's a nibble. Uh, okay. Okay, so that works. <clears throat> um, so you can do it that way, and but you can also um, you can also do this, do it manually, and assert that. If you update that, you get the same the same O you got the other way. Let me just move redundancy. Oh, it's a bundle, so I, I have to... Um, I have to look inside the bundle. OK. 
Okay. It's pretty good. So yeah, we have both modes. And, and like I said, uh, once we start doing more stateful stuff, uh, this approach where you create something and you, every once in a while, you know, you update signals at the and you recompute outputs in response. That's going to be the model when we move to more stateful systems. Um, basically, the main thing that's going to change when we move to stateful systems is there's going to be two methods. There's going to be update, which is purely functional. So you can call update as many times as you want. And as long as, and every time it's just going to recompute outputs in terms of inputs. So that's just a functional relationship. But um, the other thing, when you get to stateful systems, which are basically double buffered, at least when they're single clock, that's a good way of thinking about it. There's also going to be, maybe it should be called update in that case, uh, but you can say something like next or, or tick or something like that. And uh, that function basically forces an update to make sure all the outputs are consistent with the inputs. And then it uses the updated outputs to latch the next value of the internal state of the system which in turn will then recompute new things that will drive the next evolution and so on. So um, that's why I'm kind of encapsulating things in a class rather than starting with everything in a function like we did earlier. It's because I, I know where we're going, but hopefully that makes sense. It's also just convenient to have it wrapped up like that, I think. Once you have a lot of arguments, it's annoying to have to call functions, although you can use keyword argument dictionaries, I guess. But anyway, so I think that's it for today. That took about two hours, uh, but um, pretty happy with where we ended up. This is going to last us for quite a while. Um, to be clear, even though we're generating Python code and you know, compared to writing a graph evaluator that is interpreted in Python, this is going to be a lot faster. Um, it's still slow in the grand scheme of things, um, but you can see how we could generate C code from this very easily. The main, the main obstacle is going to be that if we want to do things that are wider than 64 bits, we have to do something extra. But if I ask you to write a C backend for the linearizer, um, as long as the bit vectors don't require more than 64 bits, you could literally do the same thing. I mean, the syntax is identical, right? Like all the operators are the same. Uh, I guess it's only some stuff like uh, you would have to replace uh, Python's conditional if with a ternary in C or something. Um, so hopefully you see how this approach is pretty powerful. And at every step, we didn't have to do anything hard. That's kind of the approach I'm taking. Every step should be easy and then you, put enough steps together and suddenly you have something with a lot of leverage. Um, there's other way, there's all kinds of ways to simulate things. You can do it this way. The reason I like having this in Python is first off, it illustrates how things are supposed to work. Like it gives us semantics. It gives meaning to the graph. Otherwise the graph is just, you know, it's just structure without meaning. So it gives meaning to the graph, but also it means that we can very quickly iterate on stuff without using external tools. And when you're iterating on stuff, you're typically not evaluating, like you're not simulating massive things where the speed up like is, is going to make or break your, uh, your workflow. So, um, but hopefully you can see how this scales to more efficient things that compile to C, for example, and then use a C compiler to generate some really efficient thing. Once you do that, all these intermediate variable, variable, variables go away, right? Because you're already writing something that's sort of in SSA form. Uh, the compiler might have a conniption because of all the local variables. That might be the only thing you have to watch out for. But um, in theory, the compiler has a lot of leeway to optimize everything out and do register allocation and, and all this stuff. So anyway, that's it for today. Um, uh, I think that will tide us over in terms of sort of language internals for a while. So next time I'm going to go back to logic design, continue where we left off. Remember, we started doing some simple ALU stuff. I think the next thing I'm going to talk about is how to write different kinds of shifters, bit shifters, rotators, and how to, in the same way that we used uh, an adder to share both the uh, adder and subtractor, choose complement subtractor, and a comparator, sort of with one circuit and some... Um, and some muxes on the inputs and outputs to kind of configure it for the operation we want to do. Uh, we're going to look how we can do similar things with bit shifters, um, share structure between rotation, uh, like, you know, RISC-V has three different shift type operations, uh, logical left shift, logical right shift, and arithmetic right shift. And I'll show you how you can basically share a structure to do all three in, in one with a little bit of control around it. Um, and actually the same thing can also do rotations, which we won't need for risk five, but is useful for other things. So that kind of stuff, we continue where we left off uh, next time with a simulator in hand so that um, we can actually run tests. And the general approach we're going to take with tests, uh, by the way, is that we're going to we're going to have Python code. Like for example, if we're writing an adder, right? Uh, or a shifter, 
we can directly use Python code to do it for us to compute the right results, and we can evaluate our circuits now using our simulator, and we just test that they compute the same result. I mean, of course, uh, and you can do exhaustive testing over some domain that's not too large. You can do randomized testing over larger domains. Um, and um, yeah, so that's that's the plan for next time. So uh, we have one more, right? This is Wednesday, so we have one more entry this week, and that's what we're going to do there. And uh, it's going to be fun. So uh, everyone have a good, uh, good week, and I will see you then.